my name is Amara Ghani. I'm the president of the Muslim Student Association uh, here at UNCA. And before um, I introduce our speaker, or before we introduce our speaker for tonight, I'd like to thank Mayan Schechter, who worked diligently throughout um, since December, trying to you know, put together this event. So, um, and a big thank you to Robert Schraub and the sponsors who helped bring our salon here for um, tonight. Um, we're also going to have a qu question and answer afterwards. So if you guys just wait until you guys get the mic, um, that'll be great. And our salon will be able to answer your questions. And um, I'm going to introduce my Schechter. Hello, my name is Mayan Schechter. I'm the Outreach Coordinator of the Muslim Student Association. Um, on behalf of MSA and all of our sponsors, I am proud to introduce uh, Arsalan Iftikhar. Arsalan is an international human rights lawyer with a degree from Washington University in St. Louis. He has recently published a book called Islamic Pacifism, Global Muslims in the Post-Osama Era, which is $15, and if you'd like, you can purchase them at the end. He is a global media commentator. He's commented on uh, BBC, Fox News. He has a weekly stint on NPR, also CNN. He is the founder of www.themuslimguy.com. Um, he will uh, hopefully talk about all things Islam. Anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce Arsalan Iftikhar. Good evening. Okay, so before I begin, if Jim Beheim's cousins weren't refereeing that game, number 16 UNC Asheville would have made history and beat number one Syracuse. <laughs> On behalf of sports junkies all around the country outside of Syracuse, New York, please know that we mourned with you. <laughs> um, that was terrible, I'm sorry, I had to say that. Anyway, moving on to more important topics. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, UNC Asheville for inviting me here tonight. Uh, more importantly, Amara Ghani and Mayan Schechter, uh, without whom I literally would not be standing here tonight. Um, I always start my speeches with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who once said that we will have to repent in this generation, not only for the actions of bad people, but also for the appalling silence of good people. And when I look at our post 9-11 world today, over 10 years later, uh, removed from the attacks of September 11th, 2001, that Dr. King quote really resonates with me, both as an American, uh, as a Muslim, and as a citizen of our global community. And I think it's important for people to have a basic understanding of a narrative history of the post 9-11 world from the vantage point of someone within the global media who's had to deal with all of these issues from within the media, and how these stories and sometimes non-stories turn into national and international firestorms uh, that affect our country and affect our world today. So I'm sure we all remember where we were on September 11th, 2001. I was a second year law student at Washington University in St. Louis. I had just turned 24 years old 10 days earlier. And Immediately after witnessing the first plane fly into the North Tower of the World Trade Center complex, um, when CNN and other media outlets started to carry statements from Al-Qaeda and other like-minded organizations, I knew immediately that the American Muslim community of over seven million people needed to issue clear and unequivocal condemnations of the 9-11 attacks. And so what I did was I, I jumped to my laptop. Not only was I an, I, uh, a law student, I was also an RA for 50 students. And um, I drafted a, a one-page, 1,000-word word condemnation editorial statement that I then emailed to every major newspaper editorial board in the country. 
Within 10 minutes, the New York Times, USA Today, Chicago Tribune, and 20 other newspapers called me and said that they were going to run my editorial on the very next day. And from that day forward, I was probably doing 12 newspaper interviews, six radio interviews, and 10, uh, five TV interviews a day. So basically, I haven't slept since 2001. Immediately after 9-11, in, in the days, weeks, and months after 9-11, the Justice Department, then led by former Attorney General John Ashcroft, began to summarily round up men from the ages of 18 to 40 who were Muslims, Arabs, South Asians, and those perceived to be Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians. In the first nine months alone after 9-11, the Justice Department rounded up over 2,000 brown men in what it called its secret roundup. The, uh, the Inspector General of the Justice Department, Glenn Fine, who also happened to be the 10th round draft pick of the 1979 San Antonio Spurs, when reporting to Congress about these secret roundups, said that the Department of Justice actually stopped keeping count after 1,200 because, quote, the statistics became too confusing. So they were rounding up so many brown men that they couldn't even keep track of how many they were rounding up. There were stories of young college-age kids who were being taken off of city buses by men in black, given no access to counsel, not even phone calls to their families for two, three, four months sometimes. There was one mother in Houston, Texas, whose 19-year-old college-age son was taken from a Houston city bus on his way to the University of Houston. She heard from him again 11 weeks later from an immigration detention facility in Louisiana. And when she went to go visit him, she didn't even recognize her own son because half of his face was swollen from the beatings that he took in prison because of the 9-11 attacks. In addition to the roundups by John Ashcroft at the time, the Department of Homeland Security instituted a program known as NSEERS, the National Security Exit Entry Registration System which basically required 87,000 men from 26 countries to register with Homeland Security who were here legally as either business persons or students. Out of those 87,000 people who legally, lawfully registered for the NCRS program, over 14,000 of them were immediately deported back to their home countries. And I mentioned that 26 countries were on this list all of these countries were Arab and Muslim countries. On the first day NCRS was actually implemented, the country of Azerbaijan was on the list. And when the Azerbaijani ambassador to the United States found out that his country was on the list, he went to John Ashcroft and he said, our people aren't majority Muslims. Next day, they were taken off the list. So these are just some of the things that our government did in the name of national security immediately after 9-11 that people never knew about. Something that I'm sure all of you have heard about at some point in your lives is a law known as H.R. 3162, the United and Strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct Terrorism Act of 2001 better known by its acronym USA Patriot. At 348 pages long, it unilaterally trumped 50 federal statutes that we had on the books. And please don't think for one moment that USA Patriot was written overnight after 9-11. I've actually met with the Republican congressional staffers who wrote it years ago, and they told me that they were literally waiting for a time where they could literally drop it in the dark of night, which is what they did at 3 o'clock in the morning on October 25th, 2001, where it would have absolutely no debate at all, which it didn't. It passed in the Senate with a vote of 98 to 1, with the lone dissenting vote being former Senator Russell Feingold of Wisconsin. Even liberal lions like the late Ted Kennedy and the late Paul Wellstone voted for USA Patriot. That's how scared our country was. Just to give you an idea of how crappy USA Patriot is, Section 402 of USA Patriot Act broadly extends the definition of the term domestic terrorism to allow local police officers to define what groups are and are not, 
quote-unquote domestic terrorists. In 2001, the sheriff of Hennepin County, Minnesota, hometown to the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, declared college student groups anti-racist action and students against war, domestic terrorists, under auspices of the USA Patriot Act. It broadly allowed for federal law enforcement agencies to come into your home, wiretap your phone, check your emails, take documents from your home, your laptop, hard drives, and not even have to tell you about it, not even have probable cause of any crime. But again, because we were so scared as a nation, nobody dared speak up against USA Patriot at the time. In addition to the legal and political dragnets that we started to see here in the United States, we also started to see the birth pangs of what people call Islamophobia on our airwaves on a daily basis. On September 13th, 2001, two days after 9-11, famous or infamous right-wing columnist Ann Coulter wrote a column where she said that we need to kill Muslim leaders and convert them to Christianity, that we need to airlift pig's blood into Afghanistan because Muslims don't touch anything having to do with pork. And she was just leading the game off. <laughs> Two weeks after 9-11, a very aptly named Republican congressman named John Cooksey, a Republican from Louisiana, was asked, during a radio interview what he thought about racial profiling. And his response, and I quote, was, if I see a guy walk in with a diaper on his head and a fan belt wrapped around that diaper, that guy needs to be pulled over. Republican Congressman Saxby Chambliss from the great state of Georgia was once quoted by the Associated Press after 9-11 as saying that we should, quote, shoot every Muslim that crosses the state line. Instead of voting him out of office, the people of the great state of Georgia decided to promote him to become their next United States Senator, which he still is today. The Reverend Franklin Graham, the former spiritual advisor to President George W. Bush, famously went on NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw in November 2001 and said that in his opinion, Islam was a very wicked and evil religion when Tom Brokaw gave him the opportunity to take back his statement, not only did he not apologize to take it back, he's actually repeated it over the years and still continues to say to this day. And the late Reverend Jerry Falwell in 2003 famously went on CBS News 60 Minutes and said for a national audience that the Prophet Muhammad was a terrorist. You can only imagine that this level of anti-Muslim rhetoric coming from some of the highest levels of our political and media circles would ultimately translate into hate crimes against Muslims, Arabs, South Asians, and those perceived to be Muslim, Arabs, and South Asians. And the reason that I say perceived is because the first hate crimes murder after September 11th, 2001, was against a man who was neither a Muslim nor an Arab. A 48-year-old gas station owner, an Indian Sikh man named Balbir Singh Sodhi, was shot and killed point blank at his Chevron gas station in Mesa, Arizona. As an adherent of the Sikh faith, he kept a turban and he kept a beard in observance of his religious tradition and because he knew and because he understood the vitriol after September 11th, every day when he would go to work, he would wear a red, white, and blue turban to work. And even that didn't save his life. A 44-year-old man named Frank Roque walked into his Chevron station one day and shot him point blank in the face. As the cops were taking Frank Roque away and TV cameras congregated onto the gas station, all Frank Roque said over and over, almost in a trance, was, I am the true patriot, I am the real American. In the first nine months alone after September 11th, 
there were over 1,700 reports of hate crimes, discrimination, and other physical assaults against the Arab, Muslim, and South Asian communities. A few weeks after 9-11, a 29-year-old man named Eric Richley from Ohio thought it would be smart to drive his white Ford Mustang into the front doors of the largest mosque in Cleveland, Ohio, causing over $300,000 in damage. Luckily, he did it at 3 o'clock in the morning, and there was no one there. But this is the kind of stuff that we had to deal with after 9-11. There were silver linings, and there are sil silver, silver linings that continue to blossom to this very day. And most of those silver linings have to do with the level and degree of interfaith outreach that has happened here in the United States and around the world between people of the Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Baha'i, and atheist communities. Several high-profile statements led by the United Nations and their newly created Alliance of Civilizations project called for reconciliation between people of all different faiths to use the tragedy and legacy of 9-11 to ensure that we lived in a world where we focused on each other's commonalities as opposed to each other's differences. There were initiatives that were done, like the Madrid Declaration, which was a joint project of King Juan Carlos of Spain and King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, which called for greater Christian Muslim understanding on the basic principles of the golden rule teachings of loving thy God and loving thy neighbor. There's the Alliance of Civilizations that I mentioned from the United Nations. There is a project called A Common Word Among You and Us, which was signed by 130 prominent Muslim scholars from around the world condemning terrorism in all of its forms. You know, it's interesting when you were introducing me, and in, in, throughout the day you've been, you, you keep mentioning that I've been on Fox News, and that's one thing that I try to play down. Although it's true, uh, I've been on Bill O'Reilly's show about a dozen times and I've lived to tell the tale. But um, what I was telling a class earlier today was that when you look at stories that affect us as Americans or even us as a global community, we have to understand how important the media is in getting out certain narratives that tend to become public opinion in general. So I start very quickly with the anecdote of the Danish cartoon controversy. Some of you might remember it, some of you might not. It was in 2005 in Denmark, there was a, a small Christian evangelical right-wing newspaper called Jyllands Posten, which decided that they were going to publish 12 cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad depicting him with a bomb-laden turban and other stereotypical uh, stuff, um, trying to get publicity for their newspaper uh, and to create a controversy, which they were successful in doing. I met with both the Norwegian and Danish ambassadors to the United States in Washington, D.C. the very next day, and they both assured me that this was a fringe newspaper that obviously wasn't speaking for the Danish or Scandinavian countries, uh, to say the least. But because of the bait that they had let out, sadly, there were some idiots on our side of the velvet rope in Muslim countries that took that bait, hook, line, and sinker. So we had fire bombings at Kentucky Fried Chickens in Beirut, Karachi, and Kuala Lumpur. There were protests at Danish and Norwegian embassies around the world. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, people were threatening to boycott Danish and Norwegian products from grocery stores. It really was a controversy. And during the entire time, the newspaper kept duplicitously hiding behind a veneer of free press. Yes, they had every legal right in the world to publish those newspapers, but even our own most prominent newspapers have something called editorial standards. They don't publish things that are just meant to incite. The executive editor of the Washington Post and the opinion page editor of the Washington Post, uh, Len Downey and Fred Hyde, both said that they would not have chosen to publish those cartoons because they added nothing to our national discourse. And the true duplicity of this right-wing newspaper was actually only found out a few months later when the Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom pointed out to a fact that they actually had turned down in August 2003, two years before, cartoons lampooning Jesus Christ. 
So they're hiding behind the veneer of free press when it comes to publishing the cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. But when responding to the cartoonists who had made these cartoons of Jesus, the editor responded by saying, I'm not going to publish these because I think they will provoke an outcry. To talk about media narratives, political narratives, I now turn to the 2008 election of Barack Hussein Obama <laughs> as the 44th president of the United States. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a Brown civil rights lawyer from Chicago, so I've known Barack since he was a professor at the University of Chicago. But looking at his election was something that I, in my 34 years thus far, have not seen in terms of the lowest common denominator of our American political system. How many of you at some point or another, just raise your hand, have heard the, the rumor that President Obama is a Muslim? Right? Yeah. You know, whenever somebody says President Obama is a Muslim, I feel like Jerry Seinfeld should pop out and say not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> because that is essentially these people's way of saying that he's black. Let's call a spade a spade. That is their way of otherizing him in a way that is actually acceptable today because there are such high levels of anti-Muslim sentiment in this country. I was talking about a, a poll earlier today which showed that 24% of Americans, I'm going to repeat that, 24% of Americans, one in four Americans, think that they do not want to even have Muslims as their neighbors. So one in four Americans, that 75 million Americans think that I am too dangerous to merely live next door to. 40% of Americans in 2006 said that Muslims should be required to carry special ID cards. 51% of Americans in 2008 said that Arabs and Muslims should have special lines at the airport where they would be subject, subjected to extra scrutiny. So Republican political operatives were licking their chops when they saw a guy named Barack Hussein Obama, and they're like, well, how do we otherize him in a way that's not going to backfire on us? Well, let's call him a Muslim. Which is really interesting, because how many of you remember the name Reverend Jeremiah Wright? So Reverend Jeremiah Wright was President Obama's pastor on the south side of Chicago, who came out with some, he had some speeches on YouTube where he was saying some outlandish things. So it was interesting because during the whole Reverend Jeremiah Wright controversy, Barack was a Christian liberation theologist. And now he's some sort of crypto Muslim Manchurian candidate. And I'm just like, pick a lane, homie. You can't be both. Either he's a radical Christianist or he's a radical Muslim. Pick one. But the thing is that this has become so pervasive that the Obama campaign in 2008 didn't even come within 10 feet of an American mosque. And to this day, President Obama has not set foot in an American mosque because every right winger will take their iPhone and snap a picture and be like, yo, there it is. <laughs> it got so toxic during the 2008 campaign in June of 2008 during a campaign event in Detroit, Michigan, two Muslim women who wore the hijab, the headscarf, were actually taken out of a photo opportunity by Obama campaign volunteers themselves. Now granted, President Obama, then Senator Obama from my home state of Illinois, called them the next day to apologize, but the damage had already been done. We knew that this narrative would continue on to this day. Last week, the Republicans had the Mississippi and Alabama primaries. There was a poll that came out which shows that today, uh, March 2012, 29% of Republican voters in Mississippi and 22% of Republican voters in Alabama, 25% of Republican voters in those two states today believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim. And 21% of those polled still think that interracial marriage should still be illegal. If you think that we live in a post-racial America, you're wrong. <laughs> I 
How many of you have heard or had heard of the Ground Zero Mosque? Right? Let me tell you a little story about that. So the Park 51 Community Center in Lower Manhattan, which infamously later came to be known as the Ground Zero Mosque, was first made public in December 2009 on page A1 of the New York Times. Front page of the New York Times and nobody said boo. It wasn't until six months later when two Republicans were running for governor in New York, one of these Republican candidates decides to take a 30 second TV ad spot out attacking his Republican opponent for supporting this Islamic community center in lower Manhattan. And that is how we got the entire Ground Zero Mosque controversy. The beautiful thing about it, and honestly, like, I, I swear to, like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a lefty human rights lawyer, whatever. Like, these right-wingers, they operate like gangbusters. And, the, the, and I'm going to give you that, the perfect example in the Ground Zero Mosque. Number one, it's not at Ground Zero. And number two, it's not a mosque. But because they had been able to embed that term into our collective American zeitgeist so well, even liberal supporters have come to refer to it as the Ground Zero Mosque. How many of you, be honest, would have raised your hands if I said, how many of you have heard of the Park 51 Community Center? Maybe one-tenth out of the rest of you would have raised your hand. It was not at Ground Zero, nor was it a mosque. You know, to the, to the detractors, they said, well, you know, where that mosque is built is, is hallowed and sacred ground. Oh, yeah? Go visit the strip club next door. It was an old Burlington Coat Factory store. And it wasn't a mosque. It's to be a $100 million, 10-story uh, community center, similar to the 92nd Street Y, where they were going to have basketball courts and culinary schools. As former MSNBC TV host Keith Olbermann once said, imagine the thought, terrorist point guards and terrorist chefs running around New York City. <laughs> no, seriously, this is the crap that I have to deal with every single day. And it's affecting us as Americans. Most recently, the controversy was over a television reality show. The TLC channel decided to air last year a reality show called All American Muslim, basically following the lives of five everyday Muslim American families in Dearborn, Michigan. One of the families was a US federal agent. One of them was the deputy sheriff of the Wayne County Sheriff's Department. One Muslim woman worked for the local judge there. And uh, one was a football coach for the local high school. Because of one fringe right-wing group in Florida, a group called the Florida Family Association, what they did was they decided to issue a letter-writing campaign to the advertisers of All American Muslim to remove their advertisements because this show did not represent the true extremist element of Islam in America, and it portrayed Muslims as normal American human beings. Because of their letter writing campaign, the hardware conglomerate chain Lowe's Home Improvement removed their sh ads from the show. As did Kayak.com, the travel website. I crap you not. So just imagine for a second, major American corporations are buckling to corporate cowardice because of a right-wing fringe group saying that you need to remove your ads from this television show because it humanizes Muslims. Now imagine if the show was called All American Latinos or All American Jews or All American Buddhists or All American Mormons. You know, it's funny to me, I actually had to, I had to go on the Dr. Drew show on CNN Headline News to debate two right-wingers about this show. And, you know, I mean, my life is, I mean, it's reached the absurd levels of an Albert Camus novel because you're having to go on television to defend a show that's just a normal, boring-ass reality show about the lives of average Americans. 
And what the right wingers say is that this does not truly represent the extremist element within the Muslim community. My good friend and Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Clarence Page of the Chicago Tribune wrote a column about it and said that that argument is the moral equivalent of saying that the Cosby show during the 1980s wasn't indicative of African American life because it didn't feature street gangs. But again, this became a major controversy. And now as we move into the 2012 elections, once the Republicans pick their nominee, we're starting to now see anti-Islamic law, anti-Sharia referendums pop up around the country. For those of you who don't know, Sharia is the basic set of Islamic laws that Muslims follow. It's sort of like Jewish people are keeping kosher. It's sort of that in terms of our personal daily lives and practice. But what prominent Republican presidential campaigns are now threatening is the Sharia creep of America. That somehow, you know, Muslims, you know, all seven million of us, less than 1%, you know, are going to convert every hot dog stand in the falafel carts in Manhattan or something. But it's gotten so pervasive. Newt Gingrich, former candidate Herman Cain, Rick Santorum, they've all said it. Even Republican frontrunner Mitt Romney once said that he wouldn't appoint a Muslim to his cabinet because he didn't think that our numbers in America warranted a cabinet position. Big talk coming from a Mormon. In 2004, when John Kerry was running for president, the, the political football, the red herring that the, the Republicans used in order to get out the vote were anti-gay marriage referendums. And so in key battleground states, what they did was they tried to get anti-gay marriage referendums on the ballots in those states to get out their base and, and get out the vote. And because the Republicans know that they have such a crappy field of candidates, now they're starting with the anti-Sharia referendums. So as of today, there are already 13 states, Tennessee, Kentucky, a bunch of others, that have anti-Sharia referendums on their ballots in one way or another, talking about how this is going to trump the Constitution of the United States. They apparently haven't read the Supremacy Clause of the United States, Article 6, Section 2, which states that the Constitution, and only the Constitution, shall be the supreme law of the land. So not only should these fools not be allowed to run for president, they should probably retroactively fail ninth grade civics class. <laughs> but this is the America that we live in today. We always have to remember that we are aspiring to become a more perfect union, that we are not a perfect union. That yes, we are the greatest democracy on earth, but we are the most perfect of an imperfect lot. And one of the, th one of the major positive trends that I have seen in my lifetime has been over the last year in what we have come to know around the world as the Arab Spring. 10 years ago, hell, five years ago, if you told any Middle East observer that Hosni Mubarak in Egypt and Muammar Gaddafi in Libya would fall in the same calendar year, we would have laughed in your face. But that's exactly what we saw last year. We saw our next millennial generation taking to YouTube and Twitter and Facebook and Skype to try and change their societies for the betterment of their next generation of boys and girls. And it all started with one 26-year-old fruit stand owner in Tunisia named Mohamed Bouazizi. Mohamed Bouazizi was a 26-year-old who had been supporting his mother and his three sisters since the age of 10, selling fruit on his fruit stand. One day, he went to sell his fruit, and a policewoman, who was a crony of the political establishment in Tunisia, told him that he couldn't sell fruit that day. And not only did that, but she slapped him in the face in front of the entire bazaar and market to see. He had had enough. So he went in front of the local city hall the next day, and he set himself on fire, and he died. And I can assure you that if Muhammad were alive today, he would have no idea that his one act 
would be the one catalyst for the phenomenon that we know as the Arab Spring. In Egypt, the largest Arab country on the face of the earth, 80 million people, not only did Christians and Muslims march side by side in Tahrir Square, known in English as Liberation Square, but young and old professionals and street beggars were all there together asking for a better tomorrow from 31 years of dictatorial rule from Hosni Mubarak. And what was fascinating about the Egyptian pro-democracy movement is that they actually reached out via Skype and they reached out to some activists in Serbia from the Otpor movement which was a nonviolent civil disobedience movement in Serbia that eventually brought down Slobodan Milosevic 15 years earlier. And the Otpor movement in Serbia via Skype taught the Egyptian activists, and PBS Frontline did a great uh, documentary on this, you can find it on Netflix, um, about how to do a successful civil disobedience grassroots pro-democracy campaign against an autocrat. So what happened in Tunisia, the Egyptians were like, we want some of that. What happened in Egypt, the Libyans said, we want some of that. Then Bahrain and Yemen and Syria, which sadly continues to this day, they all said, we want a part of that. This was our Berlin Wall moment. Between the three countries of Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia, between Husni Mubarak in Egypt, Zain al abidin bin Ali in Tunisia, and Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, you had over 103 years of dictatorial rule brought down in one calendar year. That is some gangster stuff. <laughs> now, of course, are these countries going to turn into burgeoning Jeffersonian democracies overnight? Of course not. It's going to take years. It's going to take generations. They have to, you have to establish a new constitution, a new lo rule of law system, uh, separ uh, separation of powers, things like that. But for once, these countries control their own destinies. So if tomorrow, if Egyptians vote in people that they don't like, that don't, that don't represent who they are or their aspirations, they can, for the first time in their lives, for some, many of them, they can vote them out. It's funny because, you know, we, here we are in America and, and all, you know, th throughout at least my lifetime, much of the narrative when it comes to the Middle East and the Arab world is, you know, th this trope how, you know, Arabs and democracy just don't mix, Islam and democracy are not compatible. Well, he, well here you go. You know, here are people, here are, here are youngsters. I mean, th th that's the great thing about this. It's all based on social media. In Iran, for example, in 2009, during the Green Revolution, because there was a lockdown on media transmissions from Iran, Iranian activists, young Iranian activists our age, took to Twitter to get out videos, to get out statements, because even the BBC's Persian service was not allowed to broadcast out. And so they were taking to Twitter to try and get their message out about the crackdown by the government. So what did the government do in order to try and stop that? Well, as we all know on Twitter, and by the way, if you're on Facebook or Twitter, feel free to add me. Um, on our locations, we put where we are, right? And so anybody who's in Iran would put Tehran as their location. And so what the government tried to do was they tried to hone in on the people whose location was Tehran. And so those of us around the world who heard about the government trying to do this, over 100 million of us around the world changed our Twitter locations to Tehran. <laughs> People who've never been outside Alabama, their location today on Twitter is still Tehran. <laughs> That's some gangster stuff too. And because of that, these people are still able to get their message out. And that's the great thing about the Arab Spring. That's the great thing about, I mean, the, the Middle East and the Arab world, over 60% of their populations are under the age of 24. They're, they're millennials just like us, and they represent the plurality of the populations there. So I'm very, very hopeful for the future of our generations in terms of being instantly connected via the internet and social media 
by, you know, by understanding that, you know, something that happens in Damascus, Syria, or Bali, Indonesia, or Buenos Aires, Argentina, can be seen instantaneously around the world. We have that interconnectivity, and, and that's why I do what I do. That's why I, I wrote my book, Islamic Pacifism, Global Muslims in the Post-Osama Era, because for the first time ever, young Muslim girls and boys, that's why I call it the Post-Osama Era. On, in, on May 1st, 2011, when we took him out in Abbottabad, Pakistan, from that day forward, any Muslim child, any Muslim girl born anywhere in the world would not have to carry the baggage, the political baggage of Osama bin Laden that idiots like me have been towing around for 10 years. That they actually have a chance in their countries that, that my book is trying to teach them that you can have that audacity of hope, that you can be a proud practicing Muslim and still subscribe to a platform of nonviolence in your lives that you can better your own countries and your local communities wherever you are, whether you're here in Asheville or you're halfway around the world in Islamabad. That it is the young generation, it is the millennial generation that truly, truly is the future of the world. Whether it's with the Arab Spring abroad or whether it's here in terms of our grassroots movements that we see every, every single day on every single issue whether it's comprehensive immigration reform, environmental law, or anything you can ever imagine. And so it's, it's really important to be aware. Don't let newspapers or television hosts tell you what the reality is. Go find out that reality for yourself. If somebody tells you there's a ground zero mosque, go find out if it's actually on ground zero and if it's a mosque. If somebody tells you that President Obama is a Muslim, Tell him why he's not. And tell him why it's, it, there would be nothing wrong with it even if he was. Because only when we stand up for the rights of others can we ever, ever truly protect our own civil rights. I always tell the story, I told this earlier today, and this is the civil rights lawyer in me. You, I'm sure many of you, if not most of you, have heard of the landmark Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Board of Education. 1954 landmark Supreme Court decision about a seven-year-old little African-American girl in Topeka, Kansas, who couldn't go to the local school right by her house because of segregation. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund, headed by a volunteer lawyer named Thurgood Marshall, who became the first African-American Supreme Court justice, took on the case. And not only did that case end segregation in our schools, but Brown versus Board was the legal precedent used in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which bans employment discrimination in any form in any American workplace. So every single one of us here today is protected because a little seven-year-old black girl in Topeka, Kansas, had the courage to stand up to fight for her rights. When it comes to any civil rights issue, comprehensive immigration reform, gay marriage, I'm the first one to speak out. I'm not an immigrant. I'm not gay. But I know that protecting the civil rights of other Americans is ultimately going to be the protection of the civil rights of all Americans, myself included. And so we have to understand that we do live in a global village and it, and it continues to grow on a daily basis. We have to start giving a damn about other people, about people that look nothing like us or believe in nothing that we believe in. Only then will we be able to truly, truly enrich our lives. And again, I always go back to the Martin Luther King quote that I began with, that we will have to repent in this generation not only for the actions of bad people, but also for the appalling silence of good people. I want to thank you for being here tonight, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Oh, and by the way, I was told uh, if you bought a book, I'm happy to sign it and lower the value after the talk. <laughs>
Hello. Oh. Hey, how's it going? Hey, I'm Matthew. Um, I just had a question about the National Defense Authorization Act. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with the indefinite um, detainment provision in, that was signed into law with yeah. Obama stating that he had serious reservations on that. Yeah. Do presidential reservations have any legal standing? Nope. Have they been tested? No. And will the indefinite detainment be used against minorities such as Muslims? Yeah, it, it can be used against anybody, and it's a very good question. Uh, so the National Defense Authorization Act, basically what it does is it can, so right after 9-11, uh, uh, President Bush was granted uh, something called an AUMF, the Authorized Use of Military Force, which basically is his carte blanche for the war on terror. Now, uh, what you're talking about, the National Defense Authorization Act, basically would allow for the indefinite detention of any person, including American citizens, and military tribunals for anyone, including, military, uh, including American citizens. Obviously, as you can imagine, for for human rights activists and civil libertarians, uh, it was something that um, that was of great concern to us. And this actually, I'm really glad you asked this question because this shows you how much of stone cold gangsters the Republicans are. Because the only reason that they were actually able to get President Obama to sign this was they actually slipped the NDAA, what he's talking about, into an entire defense authorization bill, which basically gave money to our military and to our defense department. And so that, the strategy behind that was, if he threatened, he threatened to veto it. So if he vetoed it, he'd have to veto the whole damn authorization bill, and the Republicans would be able to say, look, he's not funding the Pentagon, he's not funding our military, he's weak on national security. And so he was hamstrung, he did not want to do it, as you know, but he had to do it because otherwise our military boys and girls would not be able to get body, uh, the armor to protect from body piercing bullets. Now the reservations that you talk about, yeah, they, they mean nothing. Basically what he's saying is that I'm signing this crappy piece of law into, into, into law and I'm not gonna use this during my presidency. Well, Mr. President, the problem is the guy after you could. Yeah. So you're basically, you're giving the office of the president, it could be, you know, President Krusty the Clown, and he'd be able to indefinitely detain someone. So just because you're saying, all right, as long as I'm in office, this won't be used, you're not saying that if Jeb Bush comes to power in eight years, you know, homie might not use it then. So you're, you're right, it has absolutely no force of law, and, and it's very problematic. But again, you know, not only are we dealing with a president that has eight years of, you know, George W. Bush to wash off our country, but he has an obstructionist Congress whose literal job is to say no to every single thing that he does and try to make his reelection as virtually impossible as possible. And so I always tell people, and, and again, you know, having known Barack since the Chicago days, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, those of us who, who've known him, like, this is not, who we know, but again, we also know that we're also, I mean, I live in D.C., I mean, I'm a political, this is, I always tell, people always ask, you know, what's Washington, D.C. like, and I tell people that it's like the seventh rung of Dante's Inferno. <laughs> it's, it's, it's where the sausage is made, and, and we work on the slaughterhouse floor, and it is some dirty, nasty stuff, but I mean, that, you know, politics is a full contact sport, and so, it's only gonna be like, and as I'm sure many of you know, uh, on, the sec on the second day of office, he signed an executive order saying he's gonna close Guantanamo Bay within a year. Yeah, it's been a few years since then. Uh, and the reason for that is because Congress has said that we will not fund any transfers to the United States. We're gonna pass congressional legislation that is going to outlaw giving civilian trials to people held in Guantanamo Bay, even though the vast majority of them have never been charged with a crime. You know, the one time the, Ob the Obama administration tried to s show some muscle was when Attorney General Eric Holder announced that he was going to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the 9-11 mastermind, in a civilian trial in Manhattan, and all hell broke loose, and they've had to backtrack. So basically, they've been playing defense for four years. What true supporters hope is that the day after he gets reelected, God willing, for the next four years, then we'll, we'll see the real Barack because he won't have to worry about re-election and you know keeping in mind that 
you know, even in his first term, he essentially, you know, surrounded himself with, with himself with Clinton exiles who were so busy triangulating him on every major issue to the point of, of non-recognition. So I think if he wins, hopefully, then we'll, we'll see a lot of this crappy stuff be, uh, be vetoed. Anybody? Thank you. Yep. Should I stand up? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah. I was just wondering, you said earlier that you think the U.S. is the best democracy in the world, and I'm curious why you think that. Because we have a constitution that is absolutely bulletproof. If you look at any fledgling third world country in the world, in my opinion, as an international lawyer, the reason that they have such political strife is because in many countries, their constitution is not worth the piece of paper that it's printed upon. And so, you know, looking back at the Arab Spring is a perfect example of this. The reason that a lot of these autocrats were able to stay in power for 30 years was they'd be able to take the constitution and do that, and then write another one, and then when they weren't happy with that, they do that. Pakistan's a perfect example. In 60 years of existence, they've had five military dictators. The constitution's been dissolved eight times. So when your constitution isn't worth the piece of paper that it's printed upon, your Supreme Court means nothing because they can be dissolved and reappointed with cronies. No separation of powers between the executive, the judicial, and the legislative. The, it, the reason our country is the greatest democracy in the world, hands down, it's not even a close second, is because our constitution is literally bulletproof. It, 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 there, it, our, our, our legal system, our checks and balances, our separation of powers is so sacrosanct to our American way of life that, in my opinion, that's what makes us the strongest country on earth, is the rule of law. Yes, now, we have crappy laws, and, and we don't implement them in the ways that they should all the time, and that's why I said we're the most perfect of an imperfect lot, meaning we, we are imperfect as well. But, you know, compared to, you know, Zimbabwe or Afghanistan, we're a hell of a lot better too. And I think it all starts with the rule of law. And so that's why I think it's really important for all Arab Spring countries and many countries around the world to revisit their constitutional conventions. One of my law school professors, uh, Peter Mutharika, what he did in the mid 90s was I think he helped 11 Central African countries rewrite their constitutions, which is pretty gangster. And now in 15 years, those countries have prospered quite a bit because they were, you know, they were oligarchs and autocrats and things like that. But because, and, and that's what we did in Iraq. So we, we toppled Saddam Hussein. It was a crappy war. I was against it from the beginning. But the first thing we did that I think was somewhat smart was we sent over the best legal minds in the world from Yale Law School and from the International Criminal Court at The Hague to Iraq to write the Constitution. Because if we didn't do that, if we didn't make a pseudo bulletproof constitution for Iraq, it was going to devolve again back into what it was during the Saddam Hussein regime. So it's our constitution that makes us special. What are the three most important things we can do the three most important things you can do, I would say number one is to monitor your local media. And by local, you can define that in terms of whatever you want. It could be the school paper, it could be the Asheville paper, it could be North Carolina papers, it could be, it could be NPR affiliates, it could be whatever you want. It's important, uh, the media always wants to hear from the community. They, they want to know that they're on the right path. And so if you see an article that you think is completely offline, Write a letter to the editor. I actually started my career during college and law school writing letters to the editor. People ask how I got to this point. I probably wrote 500 letters to the editor before I had my first column ever published. And then I probably wrote 500 columns before I ever had my first appearance on national television. And now I've had like a thousand TV appearances and I wrote a book apparently. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a labor of love. I mean, this is like, and you're going to get your ass kicked every, if you're me, you're going to get your ass kicked every step of the way. But it, it's, it's caring about your community. And that could be however you define it. You could define your community as the world, like I do. You could define your community as UNC Asheville. 
like some of you students do. After four years, you'll leave to go to another community, and that will become your community. Getting involved in your local communities is, is essential in whatever you believe in. It could be immigration reform, it could be LGBT rights, it could be the environment, it could be en uh, renewable energy, it could be whatever. But just, but just care, give a damn about something, like get involved. Because at the end of the day, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons I was telling these, these guys earlier, you know, for all the stuff that I do, I don't enjoy anything more than coming to speak on college campuses. And the reason that is, is because I know that you guys are all the future of America. And you guys are in this amazing place in your life where you haven't been jaded by the seventh rung of Dante's Inferno like I have. <laughs> you're not children. You're still absorbing the world, but you're also formative in your thinking. You're learning who you are and what you believe in. And it's this sort of contact. It's, it's this humanization with each other. I think it is, is really important. You know, I always I tell people you know, in terms of an analogy, you look at gay marriage in America, the gay marriage debate. And the reason that the gay marriage debate has lost so much of its toxicity within the American political landscape is because, in my opinion, you could be the most right-wing, evangelical, Christian, conservative voter on the face of the earth, and you probably have a gay cousin somewhere. And you can say, well, you know, I'm opposed to gay marriage, but you know what, my, my cousin John or my cousin Jill, are, they're good people. And I say, you know, it's too bad that everybody doesn't have a Muslim cousin <laughs> to humanize them. And, and, and it really is that humanization process. So, you know, if, like, if somebody says something outlandish about any minority demographic group, speak, speak up, say something. Push back. Say you're wrong and... This is why you're wrong. And I, and I assure you, these, these small ripples will have residual effects. And so, you know, get involved in your local media, get involved in your community, and, uh, you know, don't believe everything that you read. Um, you know, even my book, when you read it, fact check it. Look at, I mean, it's 100 footnotes per chapter. But, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so it's important to, to take the time to educate yourself. You know, we live in this instant gratification society now where, you know, I remember in the, God, I feel so old. I grew up in the mid-90s, right? So when, when the internet first came out, we had dial-up internet, which was awesome. You would dial in, two minutes later, you were logged on to America Online, and that was the coolest shit we'd ever seen. And now if your Google Chrome freezes for like two seconds, people freak out. It's like, really? It's like, if you can't get to people in 140 characters or less, they suddenly tune you out. You know, I, I tell, and that's the reason I'm in the media, because I understand that sadly, as an American society, our collective attention span is that of a mosquito. No offense to mosquitoes. But it's getting bad. So it's really difficult to keep people engaged. I mean, I'm surprised you guys are still sitting here. But it is important to, to do that outreach, to actually care enough to just sit and listen and absorb. And um, I'll stop talking there. Hey, my name's Deborah. I was living and working in New York City uh, September 1st, 2011. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a liberal from New York City. Uh, the fear level was very high yeah. at that time. Just the point where people didn't even want to get on the subway. They mm -hmm. really thought that would be the next attack. Not everyone could own a gas mask. What can we do to abate these fears? We did it in World War II when we interned Japanese Americans. Right. So what, what type of forum can we start to stop that or to begin to stop that? That's a very good question. And uh, you know, even though most people know that uh, over 140,000 Japanese Americans were interned in uh, some of the more inhospitable regions of the West during the Second World War. What most people don't know is that we, as an American government, did not apologize until Jimmy Carter in 1978. 34 years later, we officially apologized to Japanese Americans for throwing them in concentration camps. Um, 
And the answer, again, is this continued dialogue, just, just outreach. I mean, most recently, one of the controversies in New York City is that uh, apparently the NYPD has been spying on the Muslim American community in New York and in New Jersey and at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, and at Rutgers in, I mean, you know, it, but they, they, they always hearken back to the 9-11 paradigm mentality. And, you know, if we continue to acquiesce to that mentality, then Osama bin Laden got what he wanted. He wanted to change our American way of life. It's our job to change it back. It's our job to, to say that we are stronger than them in terms of our resolve, in terms of our unity. You know, we, we need to use the legacy of that to help bring us closer as a nation and as a world than we did before and not make mistakes of the past. Yes, we'll make mistakes. And yes, there'll be repeat mistakes in some cases. But, you know, for the first time, you know, when Guantanamo Bay was first opened, I was on uh, ABC News Nightline with Ted Koppel, for those of you who remember Ted Koppel, uh, the night the story broke of Guantanamo Bay. Nobody would touch Guantanamo Bay with a 10-foot pole, not even the ACLU at that time. Of course, I was the brown Muslim human rights lawyer, so I had to because, you know, my cousins were in Gitmo. But, um, you know, it was only a few years later, probably four or five years later, when it actually became cool to wear closed Gitmo shirts and have Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam and Zach from Rage Against the Machine talk about Gitmo. It became a cause celebre. But it took a long time. And now you can talk about it with virtually no fear of, of political or... <laughs> maculatory retribution at all. Um, and it takes time, and I understand that. But we are 10 years removed now. And, um, you know, we have to move forward as a nation. And we can't keep hearkening back. I mean, there's some kids now who are, what, in fifth grade who weren't even born on 9-11. And so, you know, th these are the sorts of things. Th these challenges are, are the ones that really test our American social fabric, just like Pearl Harbor did. And um, it's going to take time. Okay, we have uh, yeah, we have room for two more questions, so. Uh, something that comes up for me a lot, especially when talking about groups in American culture that are marginalized, mm -hmm. is how the discourse can kind of turn into bad versus good. And I'm really interested in how the, and during this conversation, many points were brought up, which are, you know, individualized stories and should be honored and humanized for that. But what about Muslim American people who are not pacifists or are more politically radical or do not align in such a way that they would be viewed as like good Muslim versus bad Muslim? Mm -hmm. I just, I feel like sometimes that can be a side effect um, that might not enter into people individually, but could enter into like American rhetoric of talking about marginalized people. And I would just be really interested to hear what you have to say about keeping the conversation so it doesn't become, this is, a, this is like being a bad Muslim and this is being a good Muslim. No, and I think you, you kind of missed the point of what I was trying to say. I, what I'm trying to say is actually exactly that. You know, sadly for many people, they tend to equate Muslims and Islam with violence and extremism. So the reason I called it Islamic pacifism is, okay, even if you still hate Muslims, at least you're on record now and you have to say, well, I, need, I know of at least one Muslim pacifist as well. <laughs> no, seriously. This shit was thought through. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, you know, after 9-11, during the George Bush administration, for example, you know, they, it, there's this term that I absolutely despise and it's moderate Muslims. Where are the moderate Muslims? And we, I think, hate that term because it means moderate by the Bush Republican standards, you know, people who are dancing the neocon jigs and, you know, are the yes men to the administration. And, you know, we prefer mainstream Muslims in terms of representing the major cross-section of Muslim society. And, and just like any other society or minority demographic group, 
we're not a monolithic entity. So it's not a, I don't even, I don't even care about good Muslims and mad Muslims because there's nobody who can actually define what those mean. What I'm trying to show is that there is a diversity. You know, there are Muslim feminists, there are Muslim athletes. Most people don't know that the funniest dude in America, Dave Chappelle, is a Muslim. When I tell people that, they're kind of like, whoa, Muslims, funny, what? I'm like, yeah. See, to, trying to shatter these, these stereotypes or perceptions that you might have is something that is part of what I try to do each and every day. You know, my job is not to be here and label this person a good Muslim or bad. I, mean, I, didn't, I don't think I said that once. Right, right. No, but what I'm saying is I'm trying to completely get away from that paradigm to having to explain the nuance of, okay, there are some people who are sort of, you know, pseudo-anarchist Muslims and then they're like the right-wing conservative, you know, fiscal conservative Muslims. Like, we're just like everyone else. And, you know, that's the thing, like, getting back to the TLC reality show, All American Muslim, you know, I just, I liked it because it just showed that we're as dysfunctional as everyone else. You know, we're worried about paying our mortgage and, you know, worried about our kids texting too much and things like that. And so, you know, the, just the humanization process itself. I mean, when 24% of Americans think that, you know, 7 million people in this country are too dangerous to live next door to, that's a problem. When Hollywood is perpetual, I didn't even get into Hollywood. It's in the book. I didn't even get into Hollywood. Because, you know, in the 1980s, it was the Red Scare, right? It was the hunt for Red October. It was Red China. It was the communist Red Scare. And now with the post-9-11 world, it's become the green Muslim scare. So uh, you guys know the, the Fox show uh, 24 with Kiefer Sutherland? There was one season of that show where the entire plot line revolved around a Muslim family, a mother, a father, and a 15-year-old son as the splinter terrorist cell next door. That entire, I had to go on the O'Reilly Factor and tell Bill O'Reilly why he was an idiot for promoting that. Why? Because it was perpetuating that notion that you should be afraid of the brown people living next door to you. I'm not even worried about good and bad. I'm just trying to get us to the human level in some people's eyes. And, you know, you, you look at a lot of the movies, it started actually with Arnold Schwarzenegger in True Lies in 1994. That's where you saw the Crimson Jihad as the bad guy, and from then it was just, ugh. Um, and I actually wrote a column about Hollywood's portrayal of Muslims because I was actually in five seconds of a Hollywood movie. I, there was a movie in 2008 called Body of Lies with Leonardo DiCaprio and Russell Crowe, and it dealt with this whole CIA, smarmy Muslim back uh, alleys and things like that, and one of my friends who's an actor, he sent me a casting call, and I was like, you know, I've always wanted to write a column about this, about Hollywood stereotyping of Muslims. And so, uh, so I emailed the casting agent, and I said, well, here are my YouTube TV clips from the news, and I'm a six foot four Muslim, you don't find many of us. They called me the next day, they're like, we want you to be in two scenes, and so I got to see how Hollywood worked in terms of, uh, you know, perpetual, you know, it was all the Muslim women in the full black burqas, who are actually like Filipino girls in mini skirts, like five minutes ago. Uh, but seriously, it was it was weird. Um, but you know, there are so many so many societal mechanisms out there. So you have journalism in the news, you have Hollywood in the media, you have politicians themselves, you know, and then we have our our own local communities that are perpetuating these these you know misnomers about people. The immigration debate today. I mean, you know, if you look at the level of animosity and vitriol against undocumented immigrants here in the United States today, it should be bum-fuzzling. I mean, you know, we're dehumanizing people on a daily basis. During the healthcare debate, you know, how many of you remember hearing the term death panel, right? Sarah Palin said that, oh, under Obamacare, my son Trig would, or my grandmother would be sent to a death panel. I mean, like, we're getting to such epically absurd levels in our, in our political discourse today I, I mentioned my friend uh, Clarence Page, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Chicago Tribune. We had lunch about a month ago in DC and he said, Arsalan, he's like, I've been covering Washington DC for over 40 years. He's like, I've never seen this level of animosity between our elected leaders. He said during the 1980s, Ted Kennedy and Arlen Specter would yell on the Senate floor and then they'd go play a round of golf afterwards. That just doesn't happen today. There's no humanization in anything that we do. 
And so it's really, really important to humanize one, ourselves to one another. I have good friends who are right-wing Republicans, and I love them for it. And they help humanize their worldview to me, and hopefully I help humanize my worldview to them. And I hope that you all go out and help humanize yourselves to others and let others humanize themselves to you as well. One more question on this side. Hey, um, I just want to say thank you for speaking. That's, I think, you had a great lecture. Um, there's one part of this um, I wanted to question you about because there's, there's, I was uh, um, thinking about the, rec the most, thing, most troubling thing this week for me is this recent slaughtering in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, you know, by a U.S. soldier, um, and the humanizing of him. Yeah. And um, I find that extremely troubling. And um, we had the same situation with the Anders Breivik massacres in Norway. I don't know if right. you talked about that at the beginning of the, of the lecture. No, I didn't. No. Um, but, uh, and then, but these were also acts of, quote-unquote, terrorism. Yeah. Um, but yet they don't carry the same weight. They're not as charged. I'm glad you, you um, brought that up. Um, for... For those of you who might not be, so you've heard that there was an, a staff sergeant in the American army who killed 16 Afghani civilians, nine children, three women, four men, while they slept, and after killing them, put them together and burned their bodies, and then walked back to base and turned himself in. For one week, and I'm glad you brought this, this up because it shows the double standard in our media, and, and it's really, you know, it shows how these narratives, uh, you know, really help to shape a story. So for a week, they didn't release his name. And I found that really interesting. Because on the night of the Fort Hood shootings, you guys remember that? When a psychiatrist in the army named Nidal Malik Hassan killed 13 people at Fort Hood, his name was released that night. And the reason I know that was because I was on the phone with senior CNN executives who said, we're going to release his name tonight, even though the facts are still coming in. Now, the, the dude in Afghanistan who killed people was not only, uh, his, not only was his name not released, he was taken out of Afghanistan to Kuwait. He was given a pretrial hearing there. They found that they had enough probable cause to keep him in custody, moving him to Leavenworth, Kansas, where he is today. And it took them a week to come out with his name. And during that time, they let his defense attorney in Seattle basically go on TV every day, talk about his post-traumatic stress disorder, his mental health issues, his marriage, his alcoholism, the fact that he had seen his friend's leg blown off the day before, to shape the narrative. And every, I guarantee you, watch every, until yesterday, or Friday, when his name was actually released, Robert Bales, um, every story was about that narrative. They would talk about the slaughter of 16 Afghani civilians, which is a war crime. If he's found guilty, it's a, he's a war criminal. Even Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said that the death penalty is an option. Now, I'm opposed to the death penalty, and so I hope he does not get the death penalty, because those are my principles. But technically, under international law, that is a war crime. But the entire narrative for a week was all about the PTSD mental health issues that our boys and girls in the armed forces rightfully go through every day. Now, I'm sure that our armed forces don't want their PTSD issues and mental health issues to be framed vis-a-vis -vis a deranged soldier who slaughters nine children, three women, and four men while they slept at night. But again, this shows the reality that we deal with today not only in our American media, but in the global media as well. And so there are double standards, there are triple standards, there are quadruple standards, there, there are no standards. So it's important for people to have that background in terms of understanding that two acts could be committed by two different people from two different backgrounds, and you're gonna have completely, completely different media narratives about those two virtually identical topics. Sorry, just to finish my question, sure. I just um, wanted to uh, just uh, 
say, like, it seems like you, obviously you've, you've been on TV a thousand times. Um, how do you uh, question the legitimacy of the word terrorist on the media? And I, and I, and I, I would assume that being on television, um, there are also certain ethical standards. I mean, we live in a, in a nation right. that is nationalistic. And to some extent, you know, I believe that that's, I mean, one, one part that I just want, I was interested like in seeing, seeing you speak about, which I know is controversial and I, I don't want to you know, point it out, but the double standard on violence and the word that terrorism ex exists and can you humanize right. a terrorist? No, absolutely. And, and I, I've mentioned this before, and uh, you mentioned the Oslo Norway gunman Anders Bering Breivik, who killed over nearly 100 people in, in Oslo uh, and left behind a 1,500-page screed uh, of Christianist anti-Muslim rhetoric uh, talking about how he was a soldier of, of Christ by, by killing uh, these innocent kids because Europe was becoming too multicultural. And I have pointed out in CNN columns about the double standard in the terms of uh, the Oslo gunman, you notice that in the media he's always called the Oslo gunman. Very rarely is he called a terrorist. And sadly, the word terrorist has been co-opted to sadly only apply to brown Arab Muslim men when they commit acts of violence in order to further a political agenda. So if a white man commits that same mass murder for a political motive, to try and instill terror and fear, they're just a kook. And I always remind people that before 9-11, the greatest terrorist attack to ever occur on American soil was April 19th, 1995, when a blonde-haired white dude named Timothy McVeigh blew up the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. But when it comes to domestic terrorism, we only use that for people with brown skin and who have names like mine. A few years ago, there was a man, there was a 48-year-old man named Joseph Stack who flew his single-engine airplane into an IRS building in Austin, Texas. He was later found to be a, a, a proclaimed member of Tea Party movements and things like that. Once it was found out that the guy's name was Joseph Stack, everybody was like, oof, yeah, we can relax now. I assure you, if the guy's name was Muhammad Ali, Every IRS building in this country would have been on lockdown that day, the airspace around it. Pray for it, that would have happened. And there is that double standard there. That was not considered an act of terrorism. That was a deranged man flying his airplane into a building. But if it was a brown man who flew his plane into a building, that's an act of terrorism. And again, this is part of that, that, that moving forward in what we do. I mean, that's why... You, I continue to be on the media because our narrative still sucks. And I'm still trying to be a part of it to help better it. And I hope other people do it for their own causes. Um, but yeah, d double standards exist. They have existed from the beginning of time. They continue to exist. Um, and terrorism is only one of them. Um, so yeah, we have a long way to go. Yes. Okay. I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, and also, uh, for those of you who came to the open discussion in the Intercultural Center, I want to thank you as well. Um, Arslan is available to sign a copy of a book you should purchase in the back um, for $15. And uh, if you'd like to talk to him, I'm, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to talk to you. Um, so I just thank you all for coming and uh, hope you guys have a really good night. Thank you very much. <laughs>